Yeah, so I would like to learn a little bit more about you. I already have this uh, uh, idea, okay? And uh, as, as you've seen, uh, maybe through my questions, you must have noticed that I, uh, I like, I, I think you have those strong political stances, this courage, the courage to speak, and especially that you live in Canada. Actually, I've uh, so far, I've interviewed uh, a number of Canadian and uh, American activists. Um, but let's say that those who dare uh, make uh, strong political stances are very uh, uh, are very it's a very limited number of, of people who do that so again uh, uh, to find someone who's um, so outspoken in Canada uh, well uh, you got my admiration thank you appreciate that likewise thank you okay so I'll need to know m more about you so uh, nothing really very dramatic uh, Zainab, I, um, I'm 66, okay. Inshallah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Pakistani uh, and, and a dual citizen as well, Canadian. So um, so my early career was in the army. I, 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 I served in the army for seven years. I left as a captain. Uh, I joined active politics after that. One of the reasons I left the army was I was principally against martial law. And at that time, it was uh, General Zia's martial law uh, in, from 1977 to 88. I left in 81. Mm -hmm. And uh, I joined active politics uh, with with a uh, one of the, I think the only the uh, the third person in Pakistan who is respected as a politician. One was the Khaid Azam. The second was this gentleman. His name is Air Marshal Azhar Khan. He was the uh, Commander Chief of the Pakistan Air Force, an extremely upright, snow white man. You know, absolutely uncorruptible, very high moral values and standards. His party was Tehreek -e Istiqlal. You know, Istiqlal, right? So yeah. Tehreek means movement, uh, the it's, movement for justice. It's it, like it, Arabic. Yeah, it's like Arabic. Uh, and I was very active in his party. I actually became the vice uh, president of the youth wing. And uh, I was very active, I used to go in. So that period kind of lasted till about from 1981 to 1988. Then I went to the US. I got. I was working in the corporate sector. I worked for a newspaper in Pakistan called Dawn. It's one of the leading English newspapers, but I was on the on the business side, my job was to get um, uh, commercial advertisements for the, for the newspaper. I was a general manager when I left them. I was looking after their international advertising. And uh, I was in, in the US for two years. I got a scholarship, mm -hmm. uh, a competitive scholarship. So I got an MBA from Boston University. I also got a master's in economics while I was in while I was in the army, so I did privately study on my own, etc. I was there for two years, came back, uh, gave up politics, went straight into corporate world, uh, was part of two major uh, business commercial launches in Pakistan. One was the first uh, cell phone company in Pakistan called Pactel. It was a subsidiary of cable and wireless. And the second was uh, the launch of the first locally produced uh, Toyota Corolla by Toyota and I was the general manager of marketing sales. So I played some kind of major role in the launch of these two. Uh, and then in 94, I decided to give up corporate life and go into uh, consulting, business consulting. So I became a business consultant and I did that for uh, till 98. Till after that, then the sectarian violence in Pakistan started a lot uh, mm -hmm. against the Shias. And our father uh, told us to leave Pakistan, myself and my younger brother. I was uh, financially extremely well off. I, uh, the kind of money I used to be made there as a business consultant, pe even today people don't they make that kind of money. So I moved to the UAE. I had a few clients over there and I then uh, relocated myself. Uh, in, in the UAE, I was also doing... Uh, as a, a tech guy, so I partnered with a friend of mine. We started developing a search engine to compete with Google. We failed. I went bankrupt. Uh, you know, the, the, the story is that the only money I had was the 28 dirhams on the top of the fridge <laughs> in, in our home. And because I was a very successful consultant, I was financially very well off. So I lived in style. I lived in a penthouse and my children went to the American school, you know, all that nonsense. And uh, <laughs> and then there was no money, no money to pay fees. and rent. Um, So I was really down, devastated financially, emotionally, you know, every way, which way. But my faith really kept me going, Alhamdulillah. And I started, I went into academia. And for three years, I was in academia with the largest uh, higher education is, 
uh, system in the UAE, which was at that time exclusively for Emiratis. Uh, it's called the Higher College of Technology. I was there for, I think, three years. And then I, because, you know, uh, I eventually ended up being the chair and the dean of the business programs, which was, and I helped set up a lot of major uh, platforms for the UAE government and the Abu Dhabi government. I helped them set up the Emirates Project Management Association, the uh, Entrepreneurship Center with MIT. Uh, I also program manage an entrepreneurship program, which was funded by Shell, the you know the oil company. Mm -hmm. I program manage one of their MBA programs at the University of Strathclyde, in which I also taught. So did a lot of uh, you know things there. Uh, while I was in Pakistan, by the way, I also set up the uh, the first uh, Pakistan cable TV company. Uh, on my own, literally, and then, you know, one of the the current political leaders, Mosul Dane, wanted to take share, and I said, I'm not going to, going to give you anything, so I just left. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and then, you know, uh, as things would have it in uh, in 2014, uh, you know, we were just I, I never liked the UAE. I mean, it's a great country. Lifestyle is excellent, very peaceful. My wife loved it. The kids got a great education. My heart wasn't in it. I, you know, I always felt I was like a third-rate citizen or a second-rate citizen. You know, my, uh, what do they call us? Uh, you are miskin. You know, uh, so it's a very, in a very derogatory word. The word miskin was used in a, in a kind of a, not a very nice way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, and, but hey, listen, I stayed there on for 17 years. I have no one else to blame but myself. <laughs> and uh, then, you know, when it was really enough, so I said, let's move. And we, either choice was go back to Pakistan or go to Canada. We had applied for Canadian citizenship much earlier. Didn't take it up. Was about to, we we're about to lose it. So we said, okay. And then we came here in 2014, been here. Uh, you know, had a little bit of money left before coming here. I had invested a lot of my own money in a, a free education project for uh, economically deprived uh, women, uh, girls especially, uh, which was internet based. So all my money went there and I, I was hoping that I would continue my consultancy and the money would keep coming, I would keep funding this project that didn't happen. So literally I, I came here with very little money. I tried to set up my consulting practice, didn't happen. So I. You know, uh, like any self-respecting person, I decided to do something and I started to Uber. So here is this guy, you know, uh, uh, who used to make uh, $3,000 a day for a consulting fee, he was driving Uber. So I drove Uber for 15 months and, you know, desperately trying to make $220 a day. Um, I had 6,000 rides. I really enjoyed that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think, uh, Zainab, that has been the best experience, the most... Uh, ego leveling experience in my life and I'm so grateful to Allah SWT that he gave me this opportunity to be an Uber driver and at, at, at a very advanced stage in my life. I was I think 60 <laughs> or 50 or 59. Anyway, uh, and then, you know, in, in um, 20, uh, I started writing very actively in 2014. So I've written a lot. I've written about, I think, 350, 400 articles. Uh, many of them were published in a leading English newspaper called the Daily Times. Mm -hmm. um, and then 2018, when Imran uh, was coming back into power, Imran and I had been exchanging notes, political notes. He's not a friend uh, in, in a personal way, but politically, you know, I, my values were aligned to his. So he asked me to come. I went back. There was some discussion on giving me a senior role in the government. Uh, that fell through because I was very reluctant uh, I uh, had a huge uh, difference of opinion with him on some of the people he was appointing in his government in the early days. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, you know, this is not what, what you're talked about, you know, merit and all. Anyway, so uh, that fell through and then started, uh, uh, you know, a TV channel approached me and they said, we'd like you to anchor. So I started anchoring for, uh, I think it was like five days a week, prime time. It's very tough, uh, you know, it was... But I think we, we managed to get to the top nine and ten. Uh, it was a great experience. But then they started to tell me what to say and how to say. And I said, you know, go take a hike. Uh, even the army wanted to say stuff that they wanted. And I said, you know, <laughs> I say what I say. I write what I write. There's nothing hidden. It's transparent. So I spent a year plus there, came back very disappointed. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of saying, hey, is this great opportunity and Imran is screwing it up, but which he did. I think he was, uh, he really lacked uh, 
uh, experience and management and all that. And, and then, you know, uh, so I kind of went in and out of political writing and commentating, went silent for a year or two. But recently, about six months ago, when this, this whole thing drama started, I kind of jumped back into the fray and 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 started to write and uh, mm. i'm a i'm a very actively read uh, blogger in pakistan in english very actively especially amongst the the powers that be both in the civil and the military so my words have great impact and that's why you know the military establishments kind of let loose their goons on me they try and defame me and my father was a great uh, hero of pakistan mm. and you know so all that so but i'm you know it's now a uh, the skin of an elephant, you know, <laughs> it does. It used to hurt initially. Hey man, look, I was such, you know, I would never done these things. Look at what they're saying. But, you know, now I've learned to uh, sway with the punches, take them also and write. So, and then I started my vlog, as you noticed a month or two ago. Um, so yeah, that, that's it. I have very strong views uh, on uh, the few, on the history of Pakistan, why things happen. I have very strong views on uh, what is good for Pakistan and what is not good for Pakistan. I say them as it is. I think if I go back to Pakistan, they'll probably pick me up from the <laughs> from, from the aircraft <laughs> and throw me in a dungeon where no one will ever be able to either see me or hear me. <laughs> so that is, and that's, I, I married, I have a wonderful wife for 41 years. I have three children, uh, mashallah, I have a granddaughter. I have a daughter, I have two grandchildren. Uh, a daughter and a, a, a granddaughter and a grandson. I have two sons, mashallah, all very well, happy, settled, at peace with myself. No desire for money, power or wealth, just the well-being of uh, Pakistan and humanity. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, inshallah I, I pray that you get the best at all times. Um, well, it, it's, it's a busy life that you've had, a very busy one. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, I will I will go through this. I will listen to it again uh, when when this interview is over. And uh, yeah, uh, actually, some questions have already occurred to me, but I don't wish to ask you more questions because I know you you have limited time. And I will stick to the questions that I have sent you. Okay. So now let's start with the first one. You say that uh, actually I I translated this tweet from Urdu, which says 1947 liberated us geographically, but mentally we are still slaves to the British colonial legacy that grew up in all institutions. And then you uh, you say there's a must uh, for changing everyone. And uh, you say this has to start with the military. So um, could you please elaborate further on this? So, so So, so Zainab, this is a tragedy of a lot, a lot of colonial uh, countries that the British ruled over. Uh, so I, <clears throat> Nigeria is very similar. I've actually worked in Nigeria as a consultant and I find a lot of similarities between mm -hmm. the way they are uh, and, and, and we are. Our, ours is, uh, is, is an interesting phenomenon. The South Asian subcontinent, Zainab, and I, because I'm a student of history, I always uh, reflect back and, and seek uh, insights from history. In the entire uh, known history of the world, um, this uh, South Asian, when I say South Asia, you know, I'm talking currently Pakistan and uh, India and East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. In their entire, uh, and I've gone back to about 5,000 years post Mojitaro, I have never come across any uh, known documented event of a ruler of this area ever having gone out of its borders to raid or attack or conquer a neighboring land except three occasions two happened in the in the 3000 uh, AD and one happened uh, in the recent history when Ranjit Singh the Sikh ruler uh, went and conquered and occupied Kabul other than these three there is no evidence and this has been the bane of the society it has been a spineless society. It is. It has uh, always welcomed foreign uh, invaders wherever they came from. They've never put up a fight. If there was, it's just a one-odd fight. 
But otherwise, never. You know, Alexander came all the way, young kid, all the way from Greece, lorded over this area. And then we had all the Togluks and the Khiljis and the uh, Afghans and the Persho Turkmans and the Mughals and everyone coming in. And, and nothing. And this continued till 1757, till the British East India Company uh, really ex uh, kind of got their place into this into this uh, area when they when they won the Battle of Plassey, 1757 or 1757 against uh, uh, the, uh, the Siraj Adala of Deccan, because they were confined to the east. If you, the, the East India Company foray into into uh, India started from the east, so so Bengal and these areas are very important. And and then they ruled for a good 1900 years, and then in 1857, you know, the Muslims and the Hindus revolted, and uh, the entire en masse uh, soldiers of the British India Company Army. Very important to understand this, so I hope you don't mind. Because it's really important to understand why I say we're still colonial minded. En masse, the entire soldiery of the uh, British East India Company revolted against the British officers, except three uh, groups. One were the Punjabi Muslims, the Punjabi Muslims, one were the Sikhs, and, and the third were the Pathans, who were also Muslims. Except for these three groups, everyone else revolted from Bengal, Orissa, the South, Bihar. One in seven were only Muslims, six were Hindus. That was the uh, cross across spectrum that the people revolted except for these three groups. They all marched towards Delhi in May 1857, occupied Delhi, kicked the British out. And in September, the British again took over and the army of retribution or revenge, as they call it, was three quarters of it was staffed by Punjabi Muslims, Sikhs and Pathans. Mm -hmm. And then the rape of Delhi happened for two weeks. Delhi was burnt. Women were raped children were killed and, and this took place by fellow Muslims and Sikhs. So it's a very, very sad part of our history. When that happened, uh, the, 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 the British government that took over, the Crown took over, and they disbanded all the British East India Company armies. There were three of them. One was the Allahabad uh, Presidency, the Bombay Presidency and the Madras. And these three of them had army, they were completely disbanded. The entire Bengal army was disbanded, only 12 units were like, and they created a completely new army from afresh. And they said, we are going to create this army from the martial races. And the martial races were list races that they listed in which the predominantly were uh, Punjabis, mm -hmm. either Hindus or Muslims, uh, the Pathans and the Sikhs. And uh, their definition of the martial race in a, in a book of history by Dr. Jeffrey, I'm forgetting his full name. He said, they are docile, they are uneducated, they are agrarian, they will never revolt against the British. So this was in essence, their definition of a martial race, that they are fighting, they are fighters, but they are docile, they're uneducated, they're agrarian, and they will never revolt against them. So that became the precursor to the modern day Indian army, by the way, also, the, and the Pakistan army. And after 1857, all the old uh, Rajas and rulers of the principally states, they were deprived because they all joined the war of independence with Bahadur Shah Zafar, the Mughal emperor in 1857 in Delhi. They were deprived of all this, of their principalities, and they were given to those who then supported. Them. So the current day uh, uh, lords and sardars, as we call them in, in Pakistan, or jagirdars or nawabzadas, these are all titles which the British gave, uh, are, are those people who sided with the British after 1857. Okay, So that's our legacy. Okay, This is the legacy that continued till 1947. Same people, same guys, same families, nothing changed. All the uh, all the guys with, with patriotism and nationalism and love for uh, for uh, for uh, you know uh, national now oh, these are all people who were uh, literally slaves. So, 1947 happens. What happens? India gets a prime minister Nehru. Pakistan gets a governor general Azam. 
amazing man white as snow uh as saintly as you can get I, and the guy could not be bought by anyone the british really wanted to buy him off he couldn't he died within a year uh, of, of august 47 september 48 he died his other uh, lieutenant yaqub ali khan again a very brave man uh, very upright was assassinated in 1951 so india got nehru from 1947 till 1962 15 years of uninterrupted administration by their founding father jawaharlal nehru number one point to understand pakistan lost their top two clean politicians within four years of partition and and then uh, so i'll just stop it the other big change that happened and which is important to understand between india and pakistan mm-hmm. india inherited in total the entire administrative structure of what was undivided india right because the capital was delhi so delhi inherited the structure in total uh, uh, intact Pakistan which the part of Bajaj Pakistan was a was a part was a province right or or parts of provinces mm-hmm. that it inherited bits and pieces right so the court half of the court three quarters of this system three quarters of that system it did not in, uh, inherit the entire overall intact infrastructure so they literally had to scramble to get things going the only thing that they in, inherited which could be said in total was the army so the army uh, you know if you understand military uh, 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 military ethos the army's inherent ability is that if it is divided into two it will like an amoeba it will become an independent uh, body so you have a division you say okay this part go here this part go here those two will reorient themselves to become a self contained unit this is the nature of the military profession because they have to do that in the in times of war so so this is what happened now imagine that the army that we inherited you know colonial to the core okay very few people were were sent by were people who really really supported pakistan uh, in its uh, in in the fight for pakistan my father was one of them by the way and my father wrote a letter to the qaid azam on the 14th of august 1944 this is 3 years before partition but on the same day that is uncanny uh, uh what and in that letter he pours his heart out to the qaid azam he is a young lieutenant in a in the army he is a serving officer of the british indian army and he is unafraid to write to the qaid azam who is a political leader this is a court martial offense if if they could have court martialed him and thrown him out of the army and thrown him in jail but such was his fervor for pakistan not only does he write he writes it on the letter head of his uh, of his unit with the, with the stamp of his unit and the uh, you know the address of the unit and his unit name and he signs as lieutenant as jimadi and in the in the says ke qaid azam i looking for the day when when with pakistan happens my heart is for you and then he says you know i would like to donate 26 acres of my land which were given to me uh, because of my military cross that i won in burma to the muslim league fund i mean so there were people like that but very few because i know very few because i went through like 6 7 years of qaid azam's uh, communications and his letters and answers trying to find a second letter that my father had written somewhere in 45 and i could only find three letters one from my father one from air marshal asghar khan who also wrote to the qaid azam the gentleman i mentioned earlier and the third was by a civil servant called masood nabi noor there were no other military officers who wrote to the qaid azam or or showed their love so we had inherited a colonial okay we inherited a colonial judicial structure exactly the way the british left it we inherited a bureaucratic structure which was developed by the british now the structures that the british put in place for india divided india uh, sorry united india were structures which were extractive right 
keep the people in control, make sure they don't get out of hand and extract as much wealth as you can from this country and send it back to Britain. This is their sole purpose, right? And wherever we can, if we have a first world war, we need these people. So they would recruit the Indian army, send them to Gallipoli and etc. And Italy, etc. Second world war, like my father, recruit them, you know, send them to fight their war. That was all they had for India. They had no love for India. So the structures we inherited were completely good. Now, surprisingly, the structures they had in their own country, well, unsurprisingly, the structures they had in their own country, political, judicial, law and order, police, were very different to what they had for Pakistan or India, right? And and those structures, we've not been able to change. We are, our Government of India Act 1930, our Companies Act 1878, you know, the, the, these even a guy like me who's who's well versed in lots of things, even when I read the court judgments that I just read, you know, about three, four days ago, it is difficult for me to even comprehend what they're saying, the judges are saying. And you know, this country, no one can understand. This army is a, is it has a colonial mindset. It wants to follow one guy, their commander in chief, because that has been what's been instilled in their mind from day one. Your chief, your chief, your chief, your chief. Now, if the chief decides to misuse and abuse this power, as four have done earlier, and as Bajo has done now, well, you have four martial laws. When you have four martial laws, these guys then want to get themselves validated. And the, we have a spineless judiciary. His history is terrible. The judiciary then gives these uh, military dictators who have broken the constitution, impose martial law, saying, you're okay, we, we legitimize your... Uh, a rule in case of Musharraf, they gave him three years and allowed him to change the constitution also. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this, and then when these guys rule for three, four, five years, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm -hmm. They love this power. They want to stay on. So what do they do? They start to co opt the political uh, politicians. Now imagine which are the kind of political politicians who would work with them. Uh, 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 the guys who have skeletons in their cupboard, right? The guys who want to get the uh, remaining power. So they then consort with these third rate, you know, absolute looter plunderer types to extend their rule. So Zia did that with Nawaz Sharif. In 1985, he makes them him the uh, finance minister of Punjab. This guy was a guy, Nawaz Sharif, whose own father had given instruction in the company that if Nawaz Sharif ever, ever gives um, an in order about the business, don't listen to it, first confirm from me. I mean, he, this was his level, uh, his own father didn't trust his intellect. So, 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 so Zia did these and then he left, right? Ayub, when Ayub declared martial law in 1958, he had been a defense minister and interior minister since 1954, sitting in the cabinet, listening to all these squabbling politicians, you know, pulling the rug from each other's, each other, uh, uh, you know, their feet. So, so the so the military, junta leaders, the uh, spineless judiciary, and the corrupt pol politicians, this became a triad, really, which has destroyed Pakistan. And that's why there has been no innovation in our colonial mindset and structures, in our judiciary, in our police, in our bureaucracy, even in the army. You know, when I was in the PMA, even now, you're not allowed to speak Urdu in the academy. You have to speak in English. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't stand properly, say, don't stand like a bloody civilian. If you're, if you're waffling and you're not speaking, you know, logically, they say, don't uh, talk like a civilian. So this mindset of being superior and inferior, which was instilled from time immemorial by the British is still being in cell in these young impressionable mind, right? And and that is why the army has never gone against its chief. Now this is a good thing also, but it's also a bad thing. It's a good thing because this this adherence to command and not questioning the orders of a superior officer is wonderful in war. You know, you can't say Zainab says, hey, they go and attack that. Hey, and I say, hey, Zainab, can you please explain to me the pros and cons of attacking? I am philosophical. You know, you can't do that. You go and attack, right? But uh, if Zainab says, uh, hey, that I'm going to steal this uh, gold from this house and you will help me do that. 
then I will say, even then I say yes, right? Because I'm so used to listening to Zainab all the time. And that's the problem with these armies. It's, it's not a national army. It has to become a national army. It has to become a national police force. It has to become a national judiciary. It has to become a you know who's who love. Uh, I have a case filed by somebody completely fictitious. It's been there for twelve years, and there's a little stay order on it by the guy, and no action. Twelve years. I spent over. I said five, six million rupees, uh, you know, paying the lawyers and traveling every time there's a hearing. So it's a, it's a system. Imran has changed that mindset, Zainab. Mm -hmm. He may have many faults. He may be inexperienced. He may uh, be impetuous. But he has changed that thinking in the people of Pakistan. And that is why people like me are hellbent on trying to make sure that he does not fail. They do not stomp him. They do not eliminate him. They do not eradicate him. Rightly or wrongly, it is still a system of political individuals. We don't have political structures. Imran, if Imran goes today, there is no party. He has no party, right? So, so it is really important for us. So, and to and to end this answer to your question very long the start has to be with the military because that is the root of our problems because a military ruler transcends the constitution imposes martial law or does what bajwa has done masterminds a conspiracy in partnership with with the usa and collaborates with these looters and plunders who've been doing so by the way since 1985 these guys the devastation that you see in Pakistan today is because of these politicians, right? And he brings them in and he installs them back in government and he ousts uh, Imran Khan. So that is why I say it has to start with the military. You reform the military command and control structure, make sure the army chief is held accountable, doesn't have this unadulterated, unbridled, unaccountable power so we can move towards other areas of reform which is the judiciary which is the bureaucracy which is the police you know all those public sector institutions which serve the public so i'm ran khan and of course there are many reasons that have pushed the united states to overthrow him but what do you think uh, the main ones are is it his, let's say, neutrality concerning the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict? Um, is it his powerful stances when it comes to uh, critical issues uh, that matter to Muslims like um, Palestines, like Kashmir's? Or is it the, uh, the growing uh, Chinese investments in Pakistan? Um, what do you think? Just, just so, to mention uh, a few. Yeah. Zainab, Zainab, this is a really great question. Thank you. So many things uh, uh, become part of this. Now, if you if you look at uh, the history of U.S. domination of the world, especially after the Second World War, mm -hmm. you will realize that they won uh, in, in other parts of the world outside uh, Western Europe, initially also within Western Europe when there was Eastern Europe, under the USSR, they want administrations that are completely and totally aligned to their uh, hegemonic, uh, geoeconomic, geopolitical interests in the world, right? Which is America is the dominant player. You do what we tell you to do. If you don't do that, uh, you know, we're going to get rid of you and bring something. And they use very high sounding value systems like democracy, human rights mm -hmm. and and stuff like that which sound really nice that this is what we want in the world freedom of speech you know open and media and so so you know people kind of get get swayed by them um so i've lived in the u.s i understand the u.s system reasonably well because i've lived there and i lived there when i was uh, fairly mature mm -hmm. uh, and i was at university so the deep throes of a very uh, inclusive academic environment anyway uh, keeping that uh, in mind, uh, look at Pakistan. Pakistan, uh, for many years, was always a client, kind of a client state of the U.S., right? Starting from Ayub Khan, 
So client stayed with a Yukon, and when a Yukon left at 68, we had these three years of interregnum with Yaya Khan, who was a martial law, and then the country split up into two, and then came in Bhutto. Bhutto came in, uh, you know, 70, 72, end of, uh, end, end of early 72 January. And then he also asserted an independent foreign policy, okay, very independent of the U.S. And he looked east, he looked about China, he, he, he portrayed himself as a socialist uh, in the garb of people like Sukarno and all these, uh, you know, early socialist left-wing state. And uh, he, he was a, he, uh, I have a very ambivalent view about uh, Bhutto. I mean, he was a nationalist. Uh, he certainly was not a socialist because Savile Row suits and Cuban cigars and, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, but he was a nationalist. He was a patriot. And he thought that if he went the socialist way of nationalizing everything, you know, Pakistan would, would get the kind of uh, uh, government uh, uh, control over the life of the average person and maybe they'd be able to do it. But I think he didn't do it really for that purpose. He did it to acquire a completely total unchecked power. Okay, that's what he did. Mm -hmm. um, and his first uh, thing when he did that, and it's really connected to your question, was that he he appointed Zia as his army chief by bypassing seven senior generals because he thought uh, Zia was a docile guy, uh, you know, Zia used to carry, uh, when he used to go on, uh, on some functions, Zia used to carry his glass of whiskey behind him, huh? and he was this an Islamist, five-time five prayer chap. Uh, but he he was a nationalist, he did sell the country, that's, that's one of the great things about Otto. Mm -hmm. But he was flawed because he wanted power. And, and uh, the USA realized that if this guy stays on, their control over Pakistan that they had till 1971, 72 from partition is going to go away. So they got rid of him. And they got rid of him through Zia. They trumped up case of a murder in which he wasn't even directly they pull the trigger or the, you know, the knife. And then we had Zia for 11 years. And Zia tore the American line completely because there was the war in Afghanistan you know, the Mujahideen against the Soviet Union. And we were the conduit for training these fighters. The money came from Saudi Arabia. The weapons came from uh, the US and we gave them the training ground. So again, we became a client state. Uh, it left Pakistan devastated, drug ridden, drug infested, terror driven, sectarian, Shia, Sunni, that's one of the reasons I left Pakistan, right? Terrible. We, we became people who never even, you know, overtly would, would abuse each other. Highly, uh, highly uh, violent prone, uh, militant uh, organizations stood up against the Shias. Lots of assassinations took place. My own late brother-in-law, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant his soul peace, uh, was suffered and was assassinated because he was a very senior uh, leader, uh, government, uh, business leader in Pakistan. Yeah, but, but still, my, America, my yeah, sincere but still, condolences. Thank you. My, but still America is stooge, okay? Then in 88, uh, for some reason, we don't know, big mystery, his aircraft blew up, he died, so did many others. and. Benazir comes in, completely towing the line of the British, uh, of the Americans. Uh, you know, the, the foreign minister was appointed at the instruction of the Americans, etc., etc., completely towing uh, the event. After him, her came Nawaz Sharif, completely towing the uh, lines of the Americans. Then Benazir again, same. Then Nawaz Sharif again. These guys came in and out. Every time, dismissed for corruption, massive corruption, okay, which, which they were doing. And then came Musharraf, 99. And initially the Americans, uh, you know, didn't want to have anything to do with it. Well, as soon as Musharraf said yes, and the war of terror, then he became the darling of the US. He's dined and wined, and, you know, George Bush became his uh, best friend and he was in Camp Davis and, and all that plus stuff. So completely in the hands of America. And then after that came Zardari, 
Zardari, if anyone has sold out this country, it is that man. For five years, this guy was president of Pakistan. Uh, Zainab, it is like, uh, I don't know, I cannot give you a, a, an example, but if the if the, you there's a worst person in the world that you have no respect for, and if that person becomes the president of Lebanon or wherever, you know, that's the, he, this guy was a, is a mafia don, he's a murderer, he's incredibly corrupt. I mean, there are very strong uh, allegations that he was actually behind the assassination of his own wife, Benazir. Mm -hmm. So this is, and, and his own government used to tell the US, please make as many drone strikes as you want on Pakistan. We're not bothered, but we will not say anything. And you know, the largest ever drone strikes in Pakistan happened during these five years. And then we have uh, five years of Nawaz Sharif again. And uh, you know, the loot and plunder continues. And these guys are completely under the grip of America. It is only the Panama leaks that made us get rid of Nawaz Sharif. Otherwise, this guy would never have gone. Mm -hmm. And then he appoints Bajwa as his army chief under a ostensibly allegedly a deal that he will not remove Nawaz Sharif mm -hmm. and Nawaz Sharif was not removed by Baja was removed by the Supreme Court he had a very honest uh, uh, chief justice called Asif Kosa who got, uh, got rid of him and then we have Imran mm -hmm. and then Imran is a completely different cup of tea he is not listening to the Americans he wants Pakistan to have an independent foreign policy. He says, we will we will be your partners in peace, but we will not be your partners in war. We will not fight your wars. We have suffered 80,000 killed. We have suffered over $120 billion in economic losses since we've been fighting your war when Ziaul Haq uh, started in 1977, right till, uh, you know, th this thing. They wanted us to give them bases in uh, after the Afghan uh, after they pulled out of Afghanistan. Iran refused. They wanted overflights uh, over Pakistan, military overflights to bomb uh, targets in Afghanistan. Iran refused. Our very strong association with China through CPAC uh, was a huge danger, and and this is important to understand, uh, Zainab. It is basically America's war with China mm -hmm. that is really at the heart of the matter as far as Pakistan is concerned. And the other issue is our nuclear weapons. These are the only two things that bother America. Pakistan is an extension of the Chinese economic juggernaut through its uh, you know, uh, Bel uh, Belt and Bridge and Road Initiative. And of which the CPAC was there, what they said was the crowning jewel, right? The flagship, uh, which is this road from, from China right to Gwadar, all Chinese industries alongside this road, making goods, taking them to Gwadar and going out into the world. Okay, maybe we would have suffered economically, some of our industries would have gone under, but hey, listen, it's either you choose you go with America or you go with China. Okay, going with America has never caused us any good it has always le left us abandoned us and has destroyed our country and you know the americans are very impersonal i mean they don't care about countries they only care about which lobby prevails in which administration at that time whether it's obama or it's a democratic or it's republican it's really the lobby and the department of defense and the and and, and the health industry as you know are the two biggest lobbies in, in America. So Imran had, so they found in Imran, they thought he would be malleable. He'd be able to, they'd be able to. Bajwa, uh, I now know General Bajwa, now from hindsight, it's Monday morning quarterbacking, if you may call it, you know, or hindsight is division 2020, whatever you want to call it. But Bajwa was always in cahoots with the Americans and the Americans felt comfortable with him and they thought, that you know he will be able to set things right, and in a way he did, right? He 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 at their uh, at their uh, in, in in collaboration with them. In in I, I say this is a conspiracy with the Americans. He ousted Imran because there were a few people that needed to cross the floor, 
and some of them were the allies the army being the very strong dominant force you know told those guys wait at them go away uh you know ditch imran and they went away and imran lost his uh, majority and he lost his government it was all structured it was all planned it was all construed otherwise he would never have gone so that's the third thing the fourth thing uh zaina uh, is is uh, this imran was emerging as a very dominant leader people really respected him even if they didn't agree with him you know uh, muhammad bin salman muhammad bin zaid hatha ardwan you know there were people used to look i mean their wives would stand to him and wanting a selfie boris johnson wanted a selfie <laughs> with imran i mean the guy is larger than life okay and there was this danger that if he stays on there may be an emerging bloc which will be independent of the usa uh, sphere of influence um and you know i mean if you just look at the bloc if it's it's china it's russia it's pakistan it's iran it's afghanistan the entire central asian republics right uh, all of them uh, in one place turkey malaysia Uh, and just look if this became a strong economic bloc forget a political bloc economic bloc right with india out absolutely isolated because india was siding with the americans can you imagine what the devastation would have happened in in uh, in, in in the world economic order i mean even today uh, zaina look at ukraine i mean they've put all kinds of sanctions on on russia except oil Why? Because forty percent of the Western European, you see, countries buy oil from the. If they put sanctions, these countries, these economies will collapse. So it's really an economic battle. So Imran was seen as a hurdle towards this economic hegemony. Mm-hmm. Pakistan was to be delinked from China, uh, so that its it, it, its economic, as I say, juggernaut is is stopped. stifled you know for a time being in china would find its own way and unlike the us china's long term vision right they see 10 20 50 years ahead right they are not driven by which administration in this power they are driven by very long term national interest unlike unlike the us so is the us uh imran is a threat to them is china delinking and then are the smaller parts nuclear but it's not a smaller part sorry but then the nuclear we as long as we remain nuclear we're a tremendous threat to india we're also a tremendous threat to israel though we will never use nuclear uh, weapons i don't think we'll ever use them again but the fact that we have nuclear weapons and we're anti israel or we haven't recognized them you know is a, a, is gives israel sleepless nights and it gives the pro israeli lobby in the us sleepless night so denuclearization is very much part of the agenda so how do you denuclearize pakistan you make it economically completely devastated they are dying and then you say okay guys we're going to save you we're going to give you this oxygen but you have to give me that little sword that you have on the side which is a nuclear weapons and if there are pliable uh applicable government in place and applicable army chief like bajwa and applicable government in place like nawaz sharif shahbaz sharif and zardari they will say by all means right that job would be the deed would be done uh lady macbeth would have committed the murder of duncan what happens later is something else but the deed is done the nucleus are gone what do you do then right what happens to pakistan recognize israel yes sir forget kashmir yes sir improve ties with india yes sir we're gone they will balkanize pakistan they will take balochistan away they will do this sindhu thing they will start uh, you know in the northwest frontier the kp they will start uh, separatist movements there a little rump of a punjab would be left as pakistan it's a nightmare scenario zaina no pakistan pakistani no saint patriotic pakistani is willing to accept it and that is why people are with imran and that is why the us is against imran because he is a barrier against their hegemonistic designs against uh, china and denuclearization and self respect and independent we don't want to be a client state of the us why should we be
Yeah, it reminds me actually of the things happening in Lebanon. Of course, there are major differences, but it's the same thing. The the U.S. is always uh, interfering, uh, choosing who to be prime minister, who can't, uh, delaying uh, our government formation here, making things a mess, and then pretending they're giving us aid. It's it's almost the same thing. We don't have I a mean, nuclear. Hmm, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, imagine you guys don't have nuclear weapons and it's the same thing. Imagine a country that is Muslim, that wants to be independent, that wants to be self-respecting, that is not going to cow down to the U.S. Uh, bully, will partner with the American in progress, in peace, will not partner with them in, uh, what is what do you say, in, in war or, or, or their uh, hegemonistic design. Mm. That's the difference. And, and you know, I, and it's uh, something very significant is going to happen tomorrow. I don't know when your article will get published. Tomorrow, the Election Commission of Pakistan, which is seized with the case, uh, hearing a foreign funding uh, case against Imran's party. Uh, mm. And there is danger that they may actually disqualify the party in Iran. If that happens, uh, Zainab, there's going to be violence, massive anarchy. Oh. perhaps even civil war uh, and God help Pakistan if someone takes such a stupid decision they are so desperate to 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 eliminate him uh, by by doing that they want to eliminate him in a legal manner as they ousted him in a vote of no confidence as they want to ban him in this election if the election commission does not give that ruling because there is nothing against him everything that is there is above the law. All the transactions that have come into his party funds have come through bank transfers. Nothing is about, nothing is hidden. All this data is already with the election commission. They've had this data since the last seven years. So there is this desperate desire uh, to eliminate him and God help Pakistan if that happens. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, just on Ukraine, uh, that's just a little deadly element you know it, it, it was nice to say oh you know he didn't support you uh, russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. he didn't he actually said we're against war we don't want war because when you start war you don't know when it will end we want peace in ukraine he said that but he abstained from the vote right why why would we vote against russia why russia offered us oil and gas at 30 percent discounted rate and we didn't take it Right, this government was ousted. Well, our, our, our dollar has rocketed to 250. Our prices of oil and gas have gone up by three, four hundred percent. Inflation is touching 50 percent. Pakistan is dying economically. It, 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 it is a downward slide. So, I mean, did what was good for Pakistan, right? Yeah, you've already mentioned inflation. You've already expected that uh, things are going to get worse in, in Pakistan. Um, so, um, and we've seen recently, we've seen uh, a lot of solidarity marches, okay? People showing solidarity for Imran Khan. So, um, do you think that whatever happens next and the drastic inflation, is it going to make people realize that, uh, oh, what have we done? Whom have we put into office? Should we get back our uh, uh, former prime minister? Should we make use of his, uh, let's say, of his political insight? So, so, so Zainab, people already realize that. That's why the overwhelming support for Iran. You know, despite their desperate attempts to uh, uh, steal these by-elections in Punjab, on 20 seats. They were by-elections. 20 people had been de-seated because they had gone against the government's vote by the by the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. On these 20 seats, there was a by-election held under the current government, these looters and plunders, under the watchful eye of General Bajwa, who brought them in, and yet Imran won 15 of those seats. Despite all their attempts to rig and stuff the ballot, he still won 15 seats because the overwhelming uh, vote that came out to vote for him more than 50% highest, nearly highest ever in the history of Pakistan could overturn their attempts to stuff the votes. So the people of Pakistan have decided, okay, the people of Pakistan have, it is very clear, I mean, well over 70-80% of the people of Pakistan are very clear that they want him run back. 
they are very clear that general bajwa is a danger to this army and and to pakistan mm-hmm. by by insisting on keeping these people in power these guys the sharifs the sardaris and the bhuttos and bilawal and mari you know they are confirmed crooks right so we cannot expect uh, expect khair from them there is no expectation of any good so the only way out for pakistan is fair and free election mm-hmm. which are not tampered with so whoever wins those elections comes in rules and by every estimation and even before these 15 by elections i had predicted that imran would sweep these uh, by elections because of the overwhelming support we were seeing in public he will come back with a two thirds majority clearly the only question zainab is when will will it be done peacefully the powers that be general bajwa especially realizes what a massive massive existential a situation he has created for pakistan which will which is uh, hitting at the very roots of our existence by allowing this current terrible status quo to be maintained or he changes tack or he is forced to change tack by his general say we need to have post immediately free and fair election so a new government comes in takes control and tries to fix pakistan We're in for a very, very rough ride, even when Imran comes back in power, inshallah, uh, when and if he does, because the economy is literally there. It is really about an absence of, of uh, uh, you know, what do you call that? Uh, people have lost faith in the government. People have lost faith. What's, there's uncertainty. What's going to happen tomorrow? Will these guys stay? Will they not stay? Now, Imran has won the government back in Punjab, which is the largest province. even though no one listens to the those high democracy not knowing whether they're going to be there next week or or two weeks from now no one is listening to the federal government whether they're going to be there next. it's this uncertainty is killing is killing investment is killing investor confidence is killing a, a businessman and their ability to do when will the slide in the dollar stop when will this inflation you know there is just this massive uncertainty so the people of pakistan have given their view it's now formalizing it through an election i hope to god that this happen um uh prime minister khan says that when you become prime minister your responsibility is your people how does that compare to western leaders like uh, us president joe biden and prime canadian prime minister justin trudeau especially when it comes um um to funding and and supporting ukraine when canadians and americans are also suffering from inflation uh you know and a lot of other social uh, uh and economic and even environmental problems so first of all as i know you know i feel really really sorry for ukraine okay and ukrainians i feel sorry for ukrainians um You know this is what happens when America does a regime change in a country and they brought in Zelensky okay when you bring in Zelensky that was the time when uh, this was waiting to happen right the invasion by the russian i'm not defending putin's invasion of russia i think invasion of any country is terrible it should not be allowed never support it but if you're going to start putting a a mad dog or a dog or 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 uh, somebody in your backyard who is your enemy then i have to take precautions right and uh, putin had warned very early on in 2011 onwards that the line for nato stops short of ukraine if you ever try to change ukraine or bring it into nato that's a red line you will cross and we will take every and he's been saying that for 10 11 years okay mm-hmm. so this is nothing new and the americans kept pushing him they brought in zelensky then zelensky started all this and they then as soon as the russian putin found out that nato is ukraine is going to be become part of nato soon he preempted that right and he invaded the country who suffers not joe biden not trump not zelensky at the moment okay he still shows 
pictures with his wife and a god knows Vogue magazine and that. Huh? Who suffers? The ordinary Ukrainian. You know, the five and three, four, five million were left. The people who've been killed, maimed, destroyed. Businesses finished, houses destroyed. 40% of the world's wheat production is at risk. Worldwide inflation. Why? Because America chose to take a stupid step to try and put Ukraine under their hegemony. Why? What's your problem? Let them do it. They're fine this way. And you know, look at the tragedy, Zainab. They are imposing uh, 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 sanctions on the part of Ukraine that is now either allied to Russia or under Russian control. Who are they hurting? Ukrainians. They're not hurting uh, Putin. They're hurting these people. Look at what they've done to Iran. 40 years of uh, uh, sanctions. Death rates skyrocketing. Children killed. Healthcare destroyed. Who, 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 what? For what? Just because you want to be the policeman of the world? America's time is over. I'm telling you, this is the start of the end. They will eventually, they will remain powerful. They're, you know, they're a great country. The people go there, great opportunities, you know, great minds, intellect, technology, innovation, all that. But this arrogance, this supreme arrogance of saying my way or the highway, I think that period is over. Probably take another couple of decades, honestly, for it to make them realize that, you know, okay, this is our space. This is the space of China. This is Western Europe, AC. This is the other part of the world. But, uh, and, and you know, it's for Canada. I'm a Canadian, I live here. Canadian, Pakistani, Pakistani, Canadian. Canada can't do anything in foreign policy and go against the US, they cannot. Anyway, when they asked me about Afghanistan, they said, we've been asked to give a recommendation to the Canadian Ministry of Defense that there is a NATO force being planned. I think this is 2015 or 16, okay? Uh, we were given a, a force. <clears throat> Uh, a NATO force of 50,000, uh, which will stay in Afghanistan for five years and uh, will then uh, stabilize Afghanistan and then pull out. So I laughed out aloud. This guy, you know, he said, why are you laughing, uh, Herbert? I said, uh, if you multiply those five years by 100, and you multiply the 50,000 by 100. And that's the amount of troops you have there, not 50,000, but 5 million. And you want to stay there for 500 years, you will never be able to subdue Afghanistan. It is the single biggest mistake you can ever make. If I were you, I would save Canadian lives of young men and women that you're sending to certain death. Do not become part of this NATO force. It is a non-starter and a no-brainer not to go there. I don't know, I don't think they listened because the Canadian sense of truth. The NATO force were there, came out in six months, you know, touching their ears.